Dawn. Day. Dusk. The genetic dynasty. Clones of Cleon the First. Decanted at different ages. There's one thing that almost everyone agrees about when it comes to Foundation's first season. That the invention of the genetic dynasty was a great way to solve a major problem in adapting Isaac Asimov's series for television. Of course, casting Lee Pace's brother Day didn't hurt either. But in an epic story that spans centuries, giving the Empire side of the story characters that would stick around is a much better fit for the format of a multi-season television series. If you think about it, by the beginning of the second season, we'd met eight different Cleons, which would have required a lot of actors, and some of those were only in a few scenes. So this is an idea born of necessity, but it also opens up a lot of exciting possibilities, and setting it up as a trio who are all three different ages is a unique way to go about it. Having a dynasty of clones, essentially the same man running things for centuries, is a great way for the show to craft compelling stories about the rulers who oversee the decline of the galactic empire prophesied by Harry Seldon's psychohistory. If Harry's math turns out to be correct, then it's a foregone conclusion that the Cleons will have a key role in the final phase of the current galactic government. Plus, it also presents a way to introduce and include their robotic advisor, Edo Demerzel, in this part of the in-world history, something that Asimov didn't think of until much later. There is a character named Cleon the First in the books, but I'll come back to that because it's somewhat complicated to explain the differences and how everything fits together. First, let's get into how the show uses the genetic dynasty to provide some character continuity, while still having some variation since, even from the beginning, the clones aren't exactly the same. The genetic dynasty refers to individual clones of Cleon the First as extrapolations, and at any given time there are three of them living in the Imperial Palace. One of the primary reasons for using clones is to avoid crises of succession, so new clones are decanted on a 30-year cycle. Brother Day is the primary leader of the Empire who sits on the center throne from age 30 to 60. When he becomes Day, he's christened with his number in the line of succession and has the final say in all matters related to Empire. He's advised by Demerzel and his elder brother and serves as a mentor to his younger brother and eventual successor. That brother is referred to as Brother Don from infancy until he turns 30, when it's his turn to take the center throne. He's raised by Demerzel, and his role is basically just to learn how to rule from his older brothers. The eldest, who's referred to as Brother Dusk, lives a life of retirement after stepping down from the throne from age 60 to 90. When he reaches that age, he enters the final phase where he becomes Brother Darkness and is euthanized in an ascension ceremony where each Cleon is elevated to their next position and the new infant Brother Dawn is decanted. In his time as Brother Dusk, he functions as an advisor and elder statesman. He's also responsible for maintaining and adding to the Mural of Souls, which documents the galaxy's 400 years of peace and prosperity under Cleonic rule. As the seasons have progressed, we've seen that murals are located throughout the Imperial Palace, which in a way has become a character itself. Serving as the Imperial residence and seat of government, it's located at the galactic core on Trantor. The capital planet is an ecumenopolis, which is essentially a single city that covers the entire world with at least 80 subterranean levels where the citizens live and work. In season one, we saw how Trantor's designers utilized artificial projections to simulate the skies and stars below the ground. The palace is one of the few places on Trantor where you could observe the natural sky from the surface of the planet. And if you pay close attention, you can put together the way the different palace locations locations are laid out. The clones' residences are in the front of the structure facing the gardens. The Imperial landing pads are situated on the two mirrored towers behind the residences, and we can presume that those house areas like the memoriam and the room with the holographic display where they meet with Demerzel to discuss important matters involving distant planets. The throne room is located in the main area behind the towers with the mural of souls off to one side and the hall of Cleons in its main entrance where all the previous clone emperors are immortalized. 
The center tower is the Principium, where the preserved body of Cleon I is on display, situated above the area where the clones are grown. Even though there are only three living Cleons in service at any given time, beyond that one day period every 30 years when there's a brother darkness, each of the brothers has backup stored at the Principium. The current extrapolation's memories are transferred to their backup so that they can be used as a seamless replacement in case of an emergency. Of course, they go to great lengths to protect the Emperors. We've seen that they wear their own personal aura, which is a shield that protects them. And generally speaking, Day is forbidden to leave the planet so nothing can happen to him. But there are backups that retain all of their experiences and memories of the clone they're replacing, except for their death, so they never realize that they are are a replacement. All of this started 400 years before the show's premiere episode during Cleon the First Reign. He is the source of the genetic material, and all of the clones are genetically identical to him. I guess it's fitting then that he's the first Cleon we see in the show, when we see a holographic image of him that welcomes travelers to Trantor Station before they descend to the surface via the Star Bridge, which serves as a lasting monument to his legacy. In the third episode of the series, we see him discuss his plans for the genetic dynasty with Demerzel at the end of his life. I shouldn't take anything for granted. I'm loyal to the Empire. Yes, but will the Empire be loyal to you? It hasn't always shown benevolence to your kind. There is a sense of intimacy in their exchange, and later Cleon the 17th will confirm that they were engaged in a sexual relationship. Beyond that, much of the circumstances around the early plans for the dynasty and how Demerzel came to be in their service are kept a mystery through the first half of the second season. What we do know is that Cleon had regrets about not finishing the Starbridge project before he died, and had planned for an infant clone to be his successor. He trusted Demerzel to guide Cleon II and establish the dynasty, but was worried because the world hadn't always shown benevolence to robots. For her part, Demerzel appeared to show true loyalty to Cleon and his plans, and didn't appear to be too worried about her secret being revealed. It's never explicitly stated on screen, but based on how the cycles work, we can assume that Cleon III would be decanted to become the first Brother Dawn 30 years later, and by the time Cleon II becomes Brother Darkness, the cycle will be established. There would always be three of them living and occupying the three different thrones. Cleon II doesn't appear in any of the episodes, but the first clone emperor, and thus the first brother day, is mentioned in the season 1 finale. When the digital consciousness of Dr. Selden emerges from the vault, he reveals that the centuries-long conflict between Anacreon and Thespis was the result of a plot devised by Cleon II to keep the kingdoms in the outer reach fighting each other so that they would never pose a threat to him. Before I discuss the individual Cleons, I wanted to point out one of my favorite parts of this dynamic. Even though they're all genetically identical and that fosters a sense of connectedness and loyalty, they're still human which means that they all still try to individuate themselves. They all want to be remembered as the greatest version of the exact same thing, which isn't exactly easy. I like how they're all following the same lead, established by Cleon, and reinforced through their upbringing by Demerzel, but then they also have this tendency to not want to be like their immediate predecessor. And since I mentioned Demerzel, having her as an essentially immortal robot that will outlive them all is another great choice in the battle for character continuity. Demerzel is the closest thing to a family the clones have. She's also the one constant in their lives. She serves the role of their mother when they're young. She becomes their closest advisor when they're the ruler. Some of them look to her for intimacy as Cleon the First did. And when they become dust, there appears to be a phase where they resent her and sort of separate themselves because her attention is focused on their younger extrapolations. Of course, by the end of the cycle, it all comes full circle and they reconnect so that she's there with them at the time of their death. This creates some relationship dynamics that just couldn't exist in other stories. We do get to know plenty of the Cleons on screen, and that starts with Cleon the 11th, who was the first Brother Dusk we met at the beginning of the series. He was there when Harry Selden and his followers were exiled to Trantor and initially advised that they should kill Selden. 
It's through 11 that we see how the Cleons struggle with growing old. We also see him take a trip to Trantor Seer Church, inquiring if Gale Dornick was a true seer, which would give credence to the Foundation's claims that the Empire would fall. This and many other examples show that, while they are the same person, the Cleons can have very different reactions to the same situations. Later, we watch Eleven reach the end of his life and prepare for his ascension. We see his ceremony as Brother Darkness, where he's presented the new Brother Dawn, who would be Cleon the 14th. As he's completing the ritual, he hears the infant cry and worries something is wrong, but Demerzel encourages him to continue to his death, and we see him get vaporized. Cleon the Twelfth is the first Brother Day we're introduced to. He was sitting on the middle throne during the attack on the Star Bridge. And in response to that, he executed the delegations from Anacreon and Thespis and bombed both planets. That response came after he exiled Harry Seldon and his followers to Terminus. In his years as Brother Dusk, he planned to travel to the Maiden after the death of Proxima Opal, but is left behind on Trantor when Brother Day decides to go himself. At that time, he discovers that the current Brother Dawn is not an exact genetic copy of Cleon I. We meet Cleon the 13th when he was just a little guy. He was the first of the current Cleons that appears in the show and was only seven years old at the beginning of the series. If Cleon the 12th established the inherent cruelty of the brothers with his public executions, then the innocence of the youngest version of Cleon we see works well to show how there may be differences in their temperament and their development does shape them, but then also reinforces that they are essentially the same man. Cleon the 13th becomes the first sitting emperor since Cleon the 1st to leave Trantor when he travels to the Maiden to try to prevent Zephyr Halima from becoming the leader of Luminism. Halima is trying to reinstate a belief system that would undermine Luminists' loyalty toward the Empire because of their cloning. Empire is concerned that this is another sign that Harry Seldon's predictions might be coming true. Cleon the 13th decides on the grand gesture of performing one of Luminism's most sacred rituals by walking the spiral. According to their beliefs, this would allow his fate to be decided by their deities, the Triple Goddesses. He successfully completes the spiral without any assistance, but doesn't experience the vision that's supposed to happen. For that reason, he decides to lie to the Zephyrs and describes a vision that makes them believe clones have souls. Having accomplished what he set out to do wasn't enough, though, and he orders Demerzel to kill Zephyr Halima before they return to Trantor, even though she's no longer a political threat to him. Cleon the 14th was the infant who cried at Cleon 11's ascension, making him wonder if something was wrong. As he grows up, we'll find out that there definitely was. This becomes apparent first when we see him jump from his balcony, only for his life to be saved by his personal aura. Palace Gardener witnesses this, and Dawn orders the Shadow Master to find out who she is. When Brother Dust takes him on a hunting expedition, we see that there are things about him that make him different from his brothers, and he's trying to hide that. When he starts to hang out with the gardener Azora, who saw him jump, we learn that one of those things is that he's colorblind. He becomes very close to her, because as an outsider, he finds everything about the way she lives exciting, and she appears very sympathetic about his situation. Things come to a head when his genetic abnormalities are exposed by Brother Dusk at the Mural of Souls. He created a new section of the mural to commemorate their hunt, which was designed in a way to expose his colorblindness. Fearing for his life, Dawn escapes with Azora only to find out that she was part of the group that was behind the genetic modification in the first place. Their plan was to make him want to escape so they could replace him with their own clone because they needed his Imperial nanoparticles so that he could pass as legitimate. Dusk arrives in time to end their plan and Dawn has to wait for the return of Cleon the 13th who will decide his fate. While his trip to the Maiden didn't soften his feelings towards Halima, it did make Brother Day consider letting his younger brother who he raised from infancy live. This is unacceptable to Brother Dusk, and as they get into a physical altercation, Demerzel brings it to an end when Brother Dawn goes to her for protection and she breaks his neck, killing him instantly. 
While this was a traumatic experience for everyone involved, it turns out that things are much worse than that when they learn that this extends to the source material. When Cleon the 13th learns that the DNA of Cleon the 1st has been corrupted, he flies into a rage and starts to smash the glass that protects his remains in the Principium. While we don't see the conclusion of that incident, showrunner David S. Goyer has said in interviews that he believes Demerzel would be forced to kill that version of 13 in that situation, and decant another clone to take his place. From there, the story jumps ahead 138 years, which means that all the Cleons we watched in the first season are dead by the time season 2 starts. Remember, the Cleonic life cycle is only 90 years long. In the second season, Cleon the 16th is Brother Dusk, Cleon the 17th is sitting on the center throne as Brother Day, and the current Brother Dawn would be in line to be Cleon the 18th. From the very beginning, it's noticeable that the genetic drift is causing significant variation and that while they still look the same, they are no longer exact copies of the same man. Cleon the 17th embraces his individuality in ways we haven't seen in previous extrapolations and decides to end the genetic dynasty by taking a wife and producing an heir. That story is still ongoing at the time I'm making this video, so I'll come back and make an update or a part 2 whenever we find out how it ends. As I mentioned earlier, developing this cycle of clones not only solves a problem, that being television studios not wanting to greenlight a massively expensive anthology TV series with no recurring characters that fans can get invested in, but it also gives them a lot of exciting possibilities to play with as they move through time. It's not an idea that Isaac Asimov came up with, but I think it creates a situation that feels very Asimovian, and how they have this structure that they can interrogate to see where it works and where it can be stressed just like Asimov did with his laws of robotics and psychohistory. The concept is a fascinating starting point. The actors get to display their ranges across the different extrapolations, and it really adds some surprises to a story where the ending is not only inevitable, but where the dynasty's demise is a fundamental part of the premise. The writers have utilized these characters in ways that raise the Empire storyline to a place where it equals the source material. And the performances from Lee Pace, Terrence Mann, Cassian Bitten, and Laura Byrne have contributed to some of the show's most memorable scenes. The genetic dynasty has elevated the series in a way that makes it hard to imagine what it would even look like if the creators had decided to go a different way. And it seems like there's still an unlimited amount of potential there for them to tap into. There's that old saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, and the galactic empire is huge. I'm ready to watch what that fall will look like with Lee Pace's Cleon behind the wheel. I have a lot more to add about Demerzel and her influence, but since they've been hinting that we'll learn a lot more about her story in the second half of season 2, I'll wait until that comes out before I dive into it. To circle back around to the books, there is a character named Cleon the First in the Foundation series, but he doesn't show up in the original trilogy. Decades after that came out and received its fair share of acclaim, Asimov's publishers convinced him to revisit the series in the 1980s. When he came back to it, he wrote two sequels to continue the story, and when he got stuck trying to finish a third and final volume, he went back and wrote two prequels, and it's in those that Cleon the First is introduced. I won't get into any spoilers about the character, but I think I should mention that generally speaking, none of the emperors are that important in Asimov's story because the focus is on the foundation. Most of the decline and fall of the empire happens in the background without much fanfare. The same goes for Demerzel, who wasn't mentioned in the original trilogy at all. And if you're looking for connections, the Demerzel character from the prequels does have a connection to Cleon. There are two of them. Cleon II is a minor character in the original trilogy, so creating a predecessor for him was a way for Asimov to connect his stories. And that's pretty much all you need to know. I would say that the name Cleon being an anagram for clone might be almost as an important of a factor in choosing the name for the show as anything the character does in the books. And I think that's a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.